a perfect savior who did no sin, but he was punished for sins. So which sin was Jesus punished for? It was your sin and my sin because he substituted himself. I was always doubting if I'm even saved. I would constantly be in doubt if I will even make it to heaven. When they preach about the second coming of Christ, when they talk about this life of God and giving your life to Christ, I would always genuinely have given my life to him. I said a sinner's prayer, but then I still don't feel like I am saved. And I grew up in church. I was committed. But why the struggle? If the scripture truly says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free or set you free, why am I not free? Why am I struggling to do right, to live right? It was because something was off, but I did not know what was off. Welcome to my YouTube channel if this is your first time watching, and welcome back if you are returning to see this video today. In today's video, I'm speaking about how to be saved by faith. The truth is, when I believed, or accepted Christ according to what was presented to me, I thought that I needed to love God for God to love me. So I was trying to pour out this love that was not there. I was bankrupt of it, that I was trying to force myself to do to get God to love me or to even look at me or maybe to get God's attention. And that is a very frustrating place to be because it, it will always keep you in doubt if you even are saved and i know that a lot of believers are in that place whereby they don't have this blessed assurance that they have this life of christ in them and that is the place that i want to speak to the number one thing i want to share in this video is all i've seen and god does not condemn whenever they will talk about the message of repentance and salvation they will bring up romans chapter 3 verse 23 which says for all have sinned and come short or fall short of the glory of God. And truly, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But this was presented as an indictment. And at some point, some believers, even in the church circle, came to a point that they took this as a consolation. No one is righteous. Of course, that's the fact. And they said there's no saint. So with this, it was as if it was a consolation to continue living any how they wanted to live because they are in this struggle that they can't even do right even when they try so now they took this scripture out of context but this scripture was not said for us to take it as a consolation to remain in sin or to keep on disobeying god or to keep on living below what god wants for us it was not a condemnation either to make you feel guilty for being a sinner yeah that is true i wanted to get that point God did not make Paul write that for you to feel guilty that, oh, I'm a sinner. Or the, like, that was not a picture. It was written to point to the fact that every human being needs a savior. And we have only one savior, one man who is Jesus Christ, who was sent to save all of us, to save all the world. And Paul, reiterating this, said, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, it is a statement of fact to let us know that for us to get back to God or get in alignment with God, we need a savior who will take us back to him because we cannot do it by ourselves. We cannot do it by keeping the law because we can't even keep the law. Now, why was this said? It was said such that you would realize that, yes, I am a sinner and I am in need of a savior. You know, because if you are sick and you deny that you are sick, you will not look for help. Neither would you go to meet a doctor. If you are dirty and maybe smelling, sorry for using that analogy, and then you deny that you are smelling, you don't even know your condition, where you are, it will be a thing that you will not look for a bath. You will not look for a way to take a bath or get clean. It is the same thing. That if you are sinning and you continue in sin without knowing your position, you will not want a savior because you feel like you are good where you are. And God said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And continuing verse said, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. So, all have sinned is not a consolation that you would say there is no sense. No man is perfect or whatever language that has been said. But it's a statement of facts to say 
you need a savior. So all have sinned and God does not condemn you. And John chapter 3 verse 17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So God knows the condition of everybody that we are all sinners. And he says, I am not condemning you. God says, I don't want you to feel guilty. I want you to know your condition so that we can reason together. Like Isaiah chapter 1 says, come, let's reason together. Even though your sins are red like scarlet, it shall be white as snow. So that is the position. Let's get to the second point. I hope you're following me up to this point now. My second point is, and you shall know the truth, the desire for freedom. Now, this is coming from the portion in John chapter 8 verse 32 that is widely quoted. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free or set you free, depending on the translation you are using. And if I would go back to what I've been taught over time, the truth that they call, this is the gospel truth, has been messages that beat people down, that tear people down and tell you how your sin will find you out and tell you how God will find you out and all those kind of messages. And after they are done, they will tell you this is the gospel truth. Well, studying my Bible, I've not seen that picture of God who wants to come down and rain fire on the sinners, at least not yet. This is the dispensation of grace where God acknowledges that we have all sinned. And the truth is that he sent his only begotten son to come to these people who have all sinned, that none of us is perfect, none of us is righteous, but such that through his son, we could receive the life that he brings. Jesus said, I am come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. I hope this is a blessing already. So growing up, I was under this kind of teaching that taught me to clean myself before I would come to God because God is holy and I cannot bring my sinful self to him. So to accept Jesus seemed like I need to do some work. I need to clean myself. I need to let go of my sin. And my question was, if I could let go of my sin in my own strength, through my self-effort, through my self-righteousness, why then would I need Jesus? And that is the, the question. If all humans or if any human being would have been able to keep the law of God perfectly, if any human being would have been able to live right and meet up with the standard of God, there would have been no reason for Christ Jesus to come to earth to die for any human. But because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, there was need for a savior. And it is for you and I to know the situation that we find ourselves was not a situation of oh good and bad. It was a situation of life and death. As the scripture says, we were dead in our sins. To come to life is God translating us from a place of darkness, a place of death, and bringing us to life through Christ. And this is the truth. The truth is not a message the truth is not a statement the truth is a person according to the scriptures and jesus said of himself i am the way the truth and the life he did not talk about a truth he said the definite article truth so this truth we're talking about is a person and it is the person of our lord jesus christ and he came to it for one purpose as scriptures in Matthew says that he came so that he would save his people from their sins. So the teachings I got growing up made me feel like I needed to get my life right before I could come to God. It made me feel like I needed to fix myself up before I could be presentable before God. But that is not a picture. Because how could I get my life right before coming to him? And what use would it be if I could get my life right for me to still come to him? If I could get my life right by myself, I may not need him. Let's be real about that. So why would you tell me that I need to clean up before I take a bath? How would you tell me that I need to quench my thirst before I drink water? Or before I take something that will quench the thirst? How can I do it when I don't have the ability to do it? So that is the picture that is presented when people say this is the gospel truth. You have to do this before you can come to Christ. But he said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That is why he came. Because we have carried this load of religion, this load of trying to please God. For those that are genuine, genuinely trying to please God, genuinely trying to live right, 
We have carried this load. And he says, come, just like you are. I know you have struggle with addiction. I know you have struggle with sins, secret sins that nobody knows. And I can relieve you of that load. And that was my story. Because I was addicted to masturbation. And I struggled with some things in my life. And he said, come. And when I came to the truth of this, he actually cleaned me up. I tried to clean myself up by my self-will. I could not get cleaned. Instead, I got guilty each time. And Job cried out in Job 14.4, Who can bring purity out of an impure person? No one. So the truth is that Jesus came to die for sinners and you and I are qualified candidates. Yeah. All have sinned. So with this, I can say that Jesus Christ is the perfect savior for imperfect you and me. He is the perfect savior. And what qualifies him to be the perfect savior? Because scripture says of him that he did no sin. He knew no sin. In him was no sin. Now let's read this couple of scriptures which talks about that. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. First Peter chapter 2, verse 22 says, Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. 1 John 3, verse 5 says, And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in him. What a Savior we have in Jesus Christ. And you shall know the truth. Number three, the sinner's prayer. The sinner's prayer could sound like, is this like a kind of magic that when you say all your life is transformed, everything is changed from that day? No, let's delve deep into that. If you have understood me from the first point that all I've seen, the second point, and you shall know the truth, you, sh you will get to this point that the sinner's prayer that we pray, which the Bible talks about, is a place of knowledge and understanding that you are a sinner in need of a savior and you know that jesus christ is the way the truth and the life and he is the truth we speak about who will give you freedom and he came with love he did not come with condemnation he did not come to query you and says that he will send you to hell he came to love to love you to wholeness to love you to healing because you were sick in sin and that would lead me to say that I am a sinner or I was a sinner not because of the sins I committed but because of Adam's sin. Because sin was already in my DNA. So I could not but sin. And Paul Apostle in Romans 7 which I loved so much when I was struggling in sin it felt like a consolation. The things that I would not like to do I find myself doing those things. The things I would like to do I cannot do them. Oh, what miserable man I am. I loved it because it resonated with me so much. I was miserable. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I could not even let go of it by my own strength. And that is the picture you have to get. That the sinner's prayer is you coming to this place of knowledge of Christ. David said in Psalms 51, For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. Wow. And we get to talk about Romans chapter 4. 5 verse 12 when Paul narrated that when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. Now that is where we get to the sinner's prayer that when you to come to know the truth that Jesus Christ came as a righteous man who knew no sin, he did no sin, in him was no sin. It was not a man that impregnated Mary for Jesus to be born. He was born out of the holy seed of God. Like scripture said, when the angel met Mary, the power of the Holy Ghost shall come upon you. And that was how he came to be. So he is holy. No sin in him. He did no sin. He knew no sin. Now he is a worthy savior, a perfect savior for imperfect men like us. Man and woman. So, say. so now you realize that we can now come to this place of reading Romans chapter 10 verse 9 and 10 and saying the sinner's prayer that the scripture says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it is by openly declaring your faith 
that you are saved. So once you come to know the finished work of Christ at the cross, everything that he went through for you and I, a perfect savior who did no sin, but he was punished for sins. So which sin was Jesus punished for? It was your sin and my sin because he substituted himself. And scriptures in 2 Corinthians 5 talks about him that he that knew no sin was made to be sin. How was he made to be sin when he did not commit sin? He substituted himself to be us and he became sin that we who were sinners should take his place, his righteousness. And the song says, clothed in his righteousness alone on Christ the solid rock as time. So you have to get to this place such that the assurance of your salvation should be certain. You should not be in a place of uncertainty. Oh, am I even saved? When they preach a the message again about come and give your life to Christ. Oh, you are crying. You are weeping. You are now feeling guilty. Come to a place of receiving Christ truly. And that is a place of love. That he loves you and he gave himself for you and he died for you. The last point I want to share in today's video is that salvation is a free gift. Salvation is not bought. Salvation is not earned. Salvation is free. Paul Apostle, when he was talking in Romans chapter 1, says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And my question was, why would Paul say he is not ashamed of the gospel? Is this something to be ashamed of? And I realized that in Paul's time, when he talked about this message, that Christ died for everyone, and because of Christ's death and resurrection, there is justification for people who believe in him and that he died and resurrected for them. People shamed Paul, fought him, and started making statements. Oh, you say that we should do evil so that we can get good. And that is not the message. The message of the grace of God has been bastardized, granted, but that doesn't make it untrue. The fact that Christ came to earth, he died, and through his death, being a righteous man, we have all received salvation for free. That is the gospel. And there is no lie about him dying. There is no denial about him being buried. And there is no denial about him being resurrected. As sure as Christ was resurrected, that is the receipt that I can hold up and say, I have been justified because of that. So I would indulge you to go and read Romans chapter 3 again from that 23. Read it down and realize that God is justified in justifying us. So the other portion that has been used widely is Romans 6.23. And let's read that truth in that portion. Scripture says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Salvation. The free gift, the gift of redemption that comes through his death, that is how we are saved. And Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 says, God saved you by his grace when you believe and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. And in conclusion, I would like to let you know that the use of fear as a motivation to get people to be saved it is not the will of God. It is not godly. Telling people that you might die in accident tomorrow or this might happen to you or that might happen to you if you don't accept Christ today, that is not the motivation that Christ wants us to give to people. The true picture is that of a man who loves this woman so well and he woos her in love. Not by pretense, but by authenticity and honesty and transparency and openness in going to her, letting her know, I love you. I care about you. Now, it is solely this woman's choice to accept. And that is Christ's position with us. We are the bride of Christ. He came to us. He loved us. He poured out his love. It is our prerogative to say, I have seen your love. And I know you love me so much. I receive your love. I receive you. I want you in my life. Just like you want me. And that is the true picture. God woos us with his love. Not through fear. Not through manipulation. Because the use of fear and all these tricks are means of manipulating people to receive God. And that is why it never turns out well. 
Because these people, when they come, they are not on the right foundation. You are only building them on self-righteousness. And I was in that place. That's why I'm speaking about this. I, I, I was self-righteous for so long that I did not even know I was. I operated by my self-effort. I thought my willpower would do it. I thought my willpower would beat it. Yet I realized that none of that could even work. Know that God loves you so much. And to be saved, I would like you to say this sinner prayer with me today. If you would, you can repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I know you are the way, the truth, and the life. I know you gave your life to save me. I realize my position and my situation that I am a sinner from birth. And I am sorry for all the things that I have done in ignorance, not knowing that I needed you. I'm sorry for all the times I've wasted trying to do it on my own, working in self-righteousness and in self-effort. I give you my life. I believe that you died to save me. I receive your love. I receive your free gift of salvation. I receive the free gift of your righteousness. I accept you into my life. You are my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for redeeming me. Thank you for setting me free. Today, I am yours. I accept your love. And I want you to be a part of my life forever. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer and you believe everything I've said through this video, I believe and I know through the word of God that you have started your journey of love with God. And I would like you to stick with me in this channel and ask questions if you have any. Let's grow together. Let's learn about the will of God in the word of God and get the truth of God so that we can become better humans and better people who love the Lord and will love people the way the Lord wants us to. Welcome to my YouTube channel once again. And I would like you to give this video a thumbs up, share it to people if it has been a blessing to you and subscribe to this channel. I would love to see you in my next YouTube video. Do well to watch other videos that I have done already. See you next week. Bye-bye.